Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Now in this video, I'll be going through stringing a racket and I'll try to provide as much information as I can about stringing, how I do it, why, and some other related topics to stringing. Now, even if you don't own a machine, it's good to know some of this information. This way you could take your racket to your stringer more informed and this is all about me helping you improve your tennis and stringing is a big part even though a lot of recreational players don't even think about it ignore it at their own peril and let's go into why um, you could be missing out on some easy performance just by knowing a little bit more about your strings and your racket so first of all i've been stringing for probably five years and this is my second machine I had a drop weight gamma progression two or three and no frills basically entry-level machine and then it was going well so I upgraded to this and this ran me about a thousand dollars shipped so this is the Torna um, don't know the model number offhand right now. I'll put it in the text. So basically it's a standard standing, um, crank pull. So you can use the crank to pull it. You'll see during the stringing. So it's not electric, but yet this is used by many pro clubs. To string many rackets yes it's not the eight to ten thousand dollar electric string machine that is good for constant pull stringing which is probably a little bit more accurate and a little bit more efficient so if you're doing it turning over rackets two dozen three dozen rackets a day you're going to want that extra um speed and efficiency this for home machine is just fine and even for commercial use. So I already paid this off just by the string jobs I've done on the side and my own string jobs. I've more than saved a ton of money. So let's get started. Let me mount my camera and we're going to string a racket that I have for a tournament. Actually, is this is to get into playoffs so let me fix this here and hopefully we're cooking with grease here so what i like to do first is get my little magnifying glass because it helps me read this tension don't know if you can see here there's the pounds and kilograms on one side I have it pre-marked with an orange tape where I tested it and that's at the 49, it's at the 48 mark. When this is on one, you have half steps. So it's 48, 49, 50. So two slots over from 48 is going to give me a pound each mark over and that puts me at 50. so i'm set at 50 pounds and that's what i like to set my strings on and i'm using monofilament uh this is my latest favorite so this is the babylon xl natural color because i think like the blacks and the other colors uh give it a different feel so this eliminates color altering the feel of the strings it's not as fancy it's not as cute to have your strings matching your outfit but this is what i like to do so i put the reel on this reel hook there so i'm gonna do a two piece so you're gonna have the mains which are the strings that go up and down and the crosses on the side so you're gonna want about 40 feet for each so we're gonna go one, two, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, 
So we got 20 feet there. We're gonna have our angle snips here, specialty tool, see a little angle there. You'll see that when we come in to make the final cuts, the knot. So the cut here, I wanna make as sharp as an angle as possible. This helps me with clearance going into the grommet holes. We're gonna set this aside on the floor because we're sloppy. We're gonna count another 20 feet for a total of 40 feet. So one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19, 20. So this is the quickest way for me to measure what I'm, again, we're gonna cut at that sharp angle. So that's the quickest way for me to measure. What am I measuring? I'm measuring the face of the racket. So basically it's almost a foot. So if you're in the ballpark, I've wound up short very few times, usually under 100 plus um, square inch rackets. So this is my game racket. So I have my uh, Pete Sampras uh, vibration dampener here, and I put a garbage tie to keep it from flying away during matches. This way I never lose it. Whether that's legal, I don't care. So these strings, they're not broken. Uh, they could go a few more matches. I could really take them down to the point of breaking and into breaking, but this is a good key tip. For me, I feel less accurate once they get crunchy. What is crunchy? It's when the string starts to stiffen up because you're playing on clay cords, balls are a little moist and it goes through wear and tear and they start to cut in a little bit and crunchy is this. Let's see. You hear that crunch, that snap? That's very fine marks where the strings are cutting into each other. So basically, they're not moving freely as when it's a smooth new string. So that's like super crunchy. So believe it or not, once these strings stop moving, it affects uh, top spin it affects my accuracy. That's just me. I cut them out once I start noticing um, balls going out when I feel they should have gone in. And when I have new strings, I feel I make less mistakes and that translates into uh, winning more points. So it's worth it for me to cut out non-broken strings before they break and when they get crunchy so I can have better match performance. If I'm going for a practice into a clinic, I'll probably run these, but I'm going into an important match where I want results and I want to give myself the best chance to win. So I take a pair of gardening shears or any kind of cutters. What you want to do is cut this out quickly. You don't want to cut the crosses and then walk away because you don't want the frame to have uneven pressure from one side of the string to the other. So right, I go several and then I go cross quickly to even out the pressure on the frame. Then I continue cutting here and then I finish off on this side. So I put as least stress on the frame as possible. Does this make a difference? I believe so. Over the long term, it keeps your racket in better shape because most of the time it's carbon fiber and you have carbon fiber um, micro cracks with flexing of the frames and you keep your racket fresher, more crisp feeling with less age and wear and tear micro cracks. So, a racket that's been strung 
200 chimes feels less crisp than a racket that's been strung uh, a dozen times. So that's another thing to consider. And a good stringer will be quick with the little details, like cutting out the racket. I mean, like uh, cutting the strings evenly and quickly. Quickness and being able to commit to starting and finishing the string job in one sitting, meaning no interruptions. You're not going to string the mains. You're not going to string the crosses. 20 minutes later, you're not going to go take a phone call, walk away from the machine, you know. Uh, either side is the same on this. I like to mark, which I did with this sticker, which is not factory. And this is where I like to place the head. So consistency, even in placing the racket in the clamping part of the stringer is good. So these two, I apply tension, it's applying tension out and it's stabilizing the racket there. Not too much pressure. Then this is a six point machine. So you have two points and four here clamps. A good machine has a lot of points to clamp. And again, it's all about keeping the frame stable during the stringing process. So these two knobs here, I close in, I, it sets the racket there. Now I give it a little bit of tension. But right now my racket is secured to the clamps and I could begin stringing because it's ready to go. And this spins without hitting that. So this spins freely. This way you don't have to move around the machine. The racket does. So when you work on this side, you spin this side, you'll see how it goes. So another vital tool you need is a starting clamp. This is a three spring starting clamp and it holds the string. You just clamp it. And the way I start my rackets, remember, I am not a professional. I am self-taught. I watched videos like this and, and I've strung over 500 to 800 rackets and never had a failure. I probably strung more rackets than that. So a lot of people may do it differently. This is the way I do it. So what you want to do is I start with the mains first. This is a two piece string job, meaning we got two pieces. So whether you start from the top or the bottom depends on the number of uh, mains versus crosses you have. Basically, you look at the bottom. And if you have a set of grommets to here, starting here, you're going to start there. So this racket, you start at the head because at the head, I have the loop naturally together at the center of the racket. So you see the way that goes? And what I do to keep it even, I place these two strings together and I pass keeping the strings together and it should wind up even 50-50. So you see the loop here and the loop here in the head is going to be right at the center mark of the racket. Some rackets have markings where you could see, or you could go by the numbers. So once you have the two strings passed, you're even on the ends because we kept them even. I'm going to take my starting clamp and I'm going to clamp on this string. It could be either string. So what this does is this holds it so I could start adding tension and starting to add my clips. So 
this string pulls from here from this clamp clamp holds it pulls around this first loop down to here and then i'm gonna clamp it here so i move this up i slide this inside the the gripper here and as i pull tension the gripper grips it and now it's stretching the string until it releases the clip at the 50 pounds that i set it to so now it released the clip now it's locked in it's holding 50 pounds of tension now i don't want to take too long and i come so the way the clamp works it locks down here and locks the strings with this gripper you should already have it measured with this knob that adjusts to your string you don't want it to clamp too hard you'll damage and crush the string you don't want it too loose then it'll slide so these grippers have like diamond dust and give um good grip without damaging the string if set right so the first thing i do is i push it all the way down as far as i can i clamp and lock it in and now i lock in the base pretty stern because it's going to want to move and if it moves a little bit it's okay so now i'm gonna uh, release this clip here while holding the handle and i lock it back in and i back off on the tension i release the string so how that moved a little bit but it's still holding tension this is holding so what i want to do is go back underneath you saw how coming underneath uh, let you get to the tensioner if i came over i wouldn't be able to get to the tensioner so we're going to run another main up on this side and we're going to come pass through all the way we completed that loop see notice i completed this here and i'm going to need to pull tension on this but yet the tension is on this side this is where spinning the racket helps you so I'm going to place it in the tensioner, come forward, pull back. It snaps locked. It's pulling tension. Right now, I still have my clamp holding tension. So I'm going to release here and reclamp here. This way, I tension along. So first thing I do is release the base. Then I release the string. And I slide it all the way to the end. Pull up, clamp. And I lock in the base. I release the clip. I lock it in. I release tension. Now I'm free to do another pass. So right here, I could do another pass because at some point, both clamps are going to be together down here. So I want a little elbow room. This way they don't hit with each other so I'm just gonna pull one more I probably don't have to but you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment so so I'm gonna pull one more even though I don't have to but you'll see why in a moment and like I said this is the way I do it others might disagree I release the base first, release the string, come this side all the way down as far as I could go. I clamp, I lock in the base, clip, pull, release tension, and pull. Now I have three or four strings on this side done. I want to get rid of this and start on this side and get this clamp involved. This way I could start stringing the mains outward. Remember I told you about evenness of pressure so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to grab, and this is why you want below through the frame. I'm going to grab, pull 50 pounds, locks. Now this can come off because it's holding tension there. This comes in later on. Now I bring in the other clamp, same thing. As close as I could get it, clamp it and clamp the base snugly. 
Now you see how these two clamps are together here. The clearance would be super tight if I didn't go this extra string. So that's why I go extra string outside. This way there's no interference. I keep them separate. So I'm gonna release this. And in the interest of keeping a fair, even amount of pressure, I'm going to string a few strings on either side to have even tension throughout the job. So I'll string through here. Crap here. Up here so consistency is key with stringing and it's the little things that add up I believe so let's talk about a little tip here where you bring it all the way up I want to be consistent in the speed and the rate I pull tension on. So if I'm pulling at that speed, that rate, that's what I want to do the whole racket. I don't want to do one string where I go clamp. I don't want to go super slow on one string. I want to keep that consistent, which I believe overall keeps the whole string job consistent you know it may matter just a very slight but I believe the little things add up to big things so you get a lot of the little things right so now it's like even I'll do one more on this side and then I'll start again on the other side So I want to keep this constant. Now I'm starting to get some strings in the, so now I have the option of keeping this clamp lever on this side, or I have space now. I could start putting it on the inside for clearance. So I'm gonna leave that clamp there and I'm gonna come back to this side to keep even on the tension. Now, as long as you are pretty good with consistency, you could undo certain things at a certain point. You know, if you're afraid of messing up, if you're just starting, don't be afraid, you know, get some cheap strings, get a racket, do a couple, you know, uh, the knots, once you get familiar with tying the knots, they most likely will never fail. People get particular about what kind of knot you tie, how you tie it, how it looks this and that. I never had a failure in a knot and I kind of don't do the proper knot or I do a version of a proper knot which is easier for me. So if it's convenient to me and it never fails, is that a bad knot? A knot that never fails? Not for me and not for a lot of people. Ah, look at that. Not for me, not for a lot of people. So another key is your string could be jammed up over here, depending, especially poly. This is monofilament, so it's easy to work with. But you don't want to do harsh bends because then you're going to damage the string, weaken it at a certain point. Not the end of the world, but it could be the point of failure under harsh conditions. So when you're pulling through knots, be careful near the end that it's not bound up and you kink it here. So you always wanna keep awareness here. And if I see it 
here I go with my hand and fix it before I pull it through and make sure I don't get ahead of myself and too fast and start kinking lines. That's what you don't want to do. Now, as far as string patterns, uh, I would suggest taking a picture of the string pattern you had and following it. Uh, string pattern diagrams are on the Rackage website. It's confusing at first, and that's where most of your time and, and, and anxiety comes in. But once you start stringing, you see the pattern right away. You don't have to look it up. You could read it. You could tell by the closeness and the number of the grommets. You know, you got a 16 by 18, you know, uh, whatever pattern you kind of know by looking. So here I got from the center on this side, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then this one is a little tight. So if you imagine a string in there, these two are going to be close. So we're going to skip eight. So we skip one or two grommets, depending on the string pattern, depending on the racket size and, and whatnot. So this particular racket, we're going to skip this. We're going to skip there. And we're going to skip here. So now I put that there, and you could see this is even, this is even. So this stays within the pattern. You know, if I were to go in these two that I didn't skip, the string would look like that. And that looks odd, and you know you're doing something wrong. So once you get that, you're good. There's no mystery to that. It slows you down in the beginning because it's all new to you if you're a beginner stringer. That right there, I went all the way to this end. That's my last clamp on that. So I'm gonna finish up this side. And again, I come through. Sometimes the clamp is in the way when you come through. So you have this little two, a auger or whatever, the pokey thing, and you just lift the string up. This gives you a helping hand in several situations. So that's a tool that is key to have. So let's clamp this up. Remember the base comes loose, then the string. All the way to the end, clamp the string, tighten the base, unlock. We got one more before we skip. Let's come through here. I could really rush through a racket have no problems or I could take my time. So here we're going to skip again because we have on this side one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We skip eight and we start back at nine. And we skip up here also. Sometimes you skip up here and don't skip down here. It all depends on the racket. There's different flavors for different rackets and string patterns. So the mains are done. The mains are done and we got this extra string. So I could have measured maybe 18 foot instead of 20 foot and saved this much string. So instead of dealing with all that slack, I'm gonna come up here and give me a foot. And I'm gonna cut at that angle. Because when I'm going in the holes, and sometimes holes are shared, you're going to want that angle to help you. Especially on a new racket where clearances are super tight. So there's plenty of videos that go over knots. Basically, you're going to want to follow um, the pattern. So in this racket, you could clearly see this is stretched out that is stretched out so usually that's where your ending knots for the main go you got two ends so you can have two knots for the mains they happen to be up here sometimes they're down here depending if we started up here ended up here different rackets different patterns so we're going to come over here we're going to pass through this one 
So this is the situation where now you have two strings going in one hole, and this is why you cut the angle. Now, if the hole is tight, then we take out a little tool here and we help pass that through, loosening it up, spread it out. It's plastic, it stretches. Sometimes you could wet the tip of the string to help slide it through. Once you get that through, you pull it through. So the knot, basically I come along the side, bend, go down. So this is the string we're gonna anchor to, right here, the same grommet. So I'm gonna go down on this side of the string, pretty simple. When I come up, I'm gonna come through. I'm gonna come through. And then I'm gonna cinch. Now, this is where the controversy comes in. A lot of people don't like that. So this is where the clamp comes in again. You clamp up here and you're gonna cinch it by pulling away and then back. Pull it away and back and the knot gets tighter and it gives good tension. What you don't wanna do is go here up and up towards your face. Because if this breaks loose, it comes up to your face, could hit you in the face, uh, you got problems. So be safe, avoid, come back this way, even stand to the side, stand to the side. This way it slips, it goes this way, slips, it goes that way. Don't look down on here and pull up into your face. You'll get a bloody nose. God forbid, hit yourself in the eye. It'd be pretty silly. Now, that's not good enough. We're gonna double it up. So we're gonna be, go down on this side of the string, come up again, come through, cinch. So here we have my knot. I don't know the name of it. So again, we're gonna pull this way, that way, and it's snug. You're gonna release. So what you wanna do here, we're gonna bring out our cutter because we're gonna cut down and take off this slack. What you wanna do is release. This puts tension on the knot. You can even release the string. So now the knot is holding its own. It's settling in to wherever it wants to lie. And this angle of the cutter helps you make a nice flat cut, very close. So that's very close, but it's double knotted. Chances of that coming out, especially if you cinched it and did everything right, chances of that coming out is very low. So that's done on that side. So we're gonna repeat the same hole because the pattern should be the same. Go down, come up, cinch, grab our grips, pull, cinch, back, pull off, back. Could rest it on the strings. Come down, come up, cinch. And pull tension left, right, left, right. Loosen the base. You got tension on the string. Let the knot settle in. Take your clamp. Clamp it snug. Snap, boom. Mains are done. The mains are done. So, mains are done. Now we gotta do the crosses. This is what I'm talking about, consistency and a good string job and doing it in one sitting. I begin right away because right now it's pulling tension from the top and the bottom of the racket and it's deforming the racket a little bit. So we want to minimize that time of uneven stress on the racket. So again, I have my angle cut here because I might have a few shared holes here. So remember the one we skipped is the first one on the top. That's where I'm going to run my string. <clears throat> so now remember the angle 
this is where it comes in handy. So remember the first one on the top that we skipped? It should be the number eight on both sides. We're gonna come down to the next one down, the next cross. So we're gonna come down because we're gonna start from the go up one and then come down the rest. Let me show you. So I come in here, you could start on the bottom or the top of the string as long as you maintain I pull it through so I'm on top of the string below on top below so I continue to weave that pattern at a diagonal shape while pointing the string through the pattern like this using both my fingers now there's alternative way to do it some people lay their string this way and they weave up, over, up, over, up, over, up, over, up, over, sideways. They pull through. Then they continue under, over, under, over, under. And now it's weaved every other one. So I'm going to pull enough slack so I could go this way again. And I'm going through the top one. Well, let me finish by coming through this. So now that's weaved. It's up over, up over, up over, didn't skip one. Now I'm gonna go up, the first one we skipped, and I'm gonna go back. So now I'm gonna go opposite. This string's on top of the main, so I'll go below the main. On top, below, on top, below. So in order to make this easier to go through, I want this string down here because up here it's keeping it tight. It's not let me manipulate to pass through. So I bring this down here to take tension off. And that's something that's going to be followed through. Also, I like to go at an angle because it helps with tension being easier to pass through. So now I continue my pattern up, up, up. I'm going uh, to leave enough slack to be able to reach the tensioner in the machine. And here Mr. Clamp comes back into the picture. Clamps it there. It's going to hold that. Because I'm going to pull tension this way to start my first two strings. So now here is where you're going to check before you commit. You're going to check if your string pattern is good, especially in the beginning. This is going to slow you down. This is going to give you anxiety. You know, you might skip a string. You could redo at this point, slide it back out. Nothing's tensioned. Even if you tension it, you could always go back a few strings. Pain in the butt. This is why you want to do it right the first time and take your time. Don't start getting fancy going fast. So right now what I'm going to do is look controversial. I'm going to pull tension right here, but I'm pulling tension for both strings, this string and this string. If I were to do an expert job, I would pull tension on one string first. So let's do that. Let's, let's be super meticulous. I don't think it makes a huge difference, you know. So we lock tension in that string going to come we're going to find where the clamp fits we're going to clamp it clamp the base we're going to release tension here now i'm doing 50 mains and 50 crosses so i ha didn't adjust the tension if you want to adjust the tension don't go more than five pounds difference between strings that's a whole different strategy so now i'm going to come to this side and i'm going to lock tension what I'm doing here, when I lock tension, the string's a little bit out, right? Even though there's 50 pounds of tension on this, I'm straightening them as I go because it makes for a cleaner string job and you have less problems down the line. So I got two courses tensioned properly. 
my controversial way, I would have just tensioned across here and just had this one clamp and this clamp would still be floating. But we did it right to keep the haters in the comments um, down to a minimum. So now I come through, I give myself some slack and I start weaving through the strings up, down, up, down, up, down. I know because on the first one on top, I'm a, this one's on top of the string, this one's gonna start below. And then the rest of the pattern should work out. So now here's the key for the crosses. When you slide it through, as we go down, the tension, these aren't gonna be, move and there's gonna be friction. So if I just slide it straight through, I could be notching these crosses with the string burning with heat going fast, ah, slide fast. So you're gonna go nice and easy and push up, down. This way I'm not cutting into strings. I'm sharing the load throughout and I'm not ripping through. I'm going nice and easy, nice and easy. Push up, pull, push up while pulling, pull, push up, pull, push up, pull. Yeah, there's a lot of strings. We got to go through 20 feet. And we're going to go there and we're going to pull. So what I like to do, I like to straighten it out. Make it nice and straight, neat at first. It helps you keep it neat at the end. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to start weaving two weaves ahead of time. And I'll tell you the reason for that. We're gonna go at an angle because it's easier because down here the strings are more flexible than if I came straight up here. Halfway, you could pull through, makes life a little easier, less tension. And then you're gonna run it through here. Okay, so the reason I pulled two is because as soon as I put this string, it starts adding tension to the main here. I pull this through because with this slack, I'm gonna pull on the first string and put tension on it. Boom. It's, it's got tension. I'm going to make sure it's straight. I'm going to release this clamp. Clamp it here. Lock in. Now, if I did this before I ran this string through then running this string now with this pressure here, with this string uh, at 50 pounds, is much harder. So this is why I go through two. I don't pull all the way through. This is clamped. So now I will pass through like before with less tension. Then I'm here, and then I'm going to do the same here. I'm not gonna tension this line, it's gonna sit there. I'm gonna come through, follow the pattern, weave, weave. It's still nice and soft, so I'll go all the way through. I didn't have to stop halfway. And it depends what kind of strings you have to. Poly is more uh, pain in the butt. So I'm gonna leave this here, but I have to do one special thing before I continue. I still have my starting clamp here. This is not tied off. So what I'm gonna do, since I tensioned here, this is okay to release. So right now this is starting clamp and this clamp are holding tensions in the top strings. I need to replace this with this now. This is why I left this much slack. I come over here, I pull tension. Now this is obsolete. 
It's gone until we tie the ending knots. Now this clamp is free. You come up here as close as you can, clamp it, tighten the base, release tension. So now we have untensioned string, like half an inch, quarter of an inch. And now we're gonna tie off the top of the main. I know it's this hole because of the way the loop is. And we go through here and it's the same knot. Every knot is the same. We're gonna keep it away from my face. Pull here, back, pull here, back. Don't go crazy here, it's not necessary. Don't trying to kill yourself, you know. The rack is gonna lose tension as soon as you pull it out the machine and it's gonna lose tension every ball you hit. Every day it's in, not even hitting balls. It's just a fact of life. Don't go crazy with, oh, my rack tension's this, my rack tension's that. Just do your best to keep it consistent, neat. So now I tied off the main here. This clamp is no longer needed. Base. Now we're free to continue till the end of the racket. So I'll go a little bit quicker. Now, what I was talking about before, uh, I feel my strings start losing consistency and start losing accuracy um, before they break. And I've asked other people to see if they've experienced the same thing. Uh, some people who string themselves and, and whatnot. And we talk about these things and we try to learn from each other. I try to gather info to see if my feelings are, are felt. Uh, most times not, I think I'm crazy, but every little bit of information I learn and I use that can help my game, I need it because I'm not getting younger. So you might as well try to get smarter. So remember straightening out the strings, I continue the pattern. So this pattern is the same pattern we're gonna repeat all the way down. So once you get tying off the main with the finishing knot on top, then it's just following the pattern, doing the two strings, and you get into a rhythm here. So yeah, so this racket, as soon as I start hitting balls, is gonna feel amazing, it's gonna feel plush, because the strings have a little bit of movement when they slide against each other and they're not crunchy. Remember the beginning of the video where they were crunchy and not moving and stiff? Now the strings, look at this, that's nice and smooth. That's gonna be where I'm gonna get my good feeling from and my accuracy in the first few hours of this string job. So I'm gonna feel like I play amazing. I'm gonna feel like every shot that I wanna hit goes in and I attribute that good feeling to maybe it's just power suggestion or you actually feel the difference. I believe it's true that you feel the difference. This is why the pros change their rackets every change of balls because they're playing with poly strings and sometimes a uh, natural gut. And the poly strings on top of poly strings lock in once they start getting that that cut in the strings, especially with the way the power the pros hit and the spin they apply with the technique. So they especially have to change strings often. That's why it has several rackets in the bag ready to go. You know, us recreational players. Uh, It'd be quite expensive to change strings or rackets every change of balls, which is 
kind of insane unless you have the money and time. Even if you string yourself, it's it's almost it's pretty crazy if you do that, you know. And if you are doing that, then then you are a real tennis player. I gotta give you credit. You know, I changed my strings probably three or four matches with a few practice sessions in between. And that seems like a lot to people. For me, that would be like two to three weeks, depending how hard I was hitting. Uh, you know, if I'm just hitting around, screwing around with, you know, no killer shots, you know, maybe I'm recovering from... I'm just having a light day, then the strings are going to last longer. But if I'm hitting big serves and important matches and taking big cuts, overheads, and putting a lot of punishment on the strings, then, of course, more often, I'll be changing strings. So, so recreational players, I see that they don't change their strings until they break, which is... I believe they're missing out on a lot of opportunity to play their best tennis. You know, you spent the money, $200, $250 on a racket, and then you're going to go neglect your strings. That's like buying a Porsche 911 and not changing the oil for 15,000 miles, and yet you're... Revving that engine, if you got turbos, that's even more insane, you know, uh, the same thing with strings, if you got a good racket, let's get the most out of the racket by having fresh strings, especially poly, because poly stretches and then doesn't stretch back. So your strings could go dead quickly with poly. And dead strings equals arm pain. You feel you have to hit harder to get the same result. Maybe you're not getting that spin you were getting. Definitely not getting the spin. Because there's a thing called snapback where the string moves on contact on the ball and kind of helps launch it depending if you're trying to hit with topspin. If your string is dead and not moving because it's cut in and crunchy, you're lost. Snapback effect. You know, I wonder, <laughs> it'd be interesting to see a pro player play with a fresh, one set with a fresh bed of poly, and then someone come in and give them poly that is notched in and let's see, because they're more sensitive to their equipment. They'll probably want to smash that racket and throw it out because it probably will affect their game. I mean, it definitely will affect their game. I wonder if they've done a test like that. Maybe that's a video I should do. You know, I would have to find somebody with a matching pair of rackets, string them up. Have one old racket with old strings and one fresh string and see what their opinion is. But I'm sure if you go to high level players and ask them what's their stringing strategy, I bet you most of them, if they're not savages and just lazy and cheap, they probably do have a string strategy. So, all this information, how does it relate to a recreational player? Well, we struggle with technique, fitness, lack of time to play, too much downtime between matches, hitting sessions. So, we also spend a lot of money and effort to go to a tennis court and try to enjoy tennis. And if you're showing up with crappy strings and equipment, you're, 
not taking advantage of all the effort you've done to to enjoy the game and and hitting a ball, having it go in and having it feel good on your arm. That gives like a dopamine effect. This is why sports and stuff, hobbies get addictive because you get that feeling and you go back to repeat. This is why people hit, play tennis. They could play every day if it wasn't hard on the body. Some people do play every day. And the feeling of hitting a ball, having it go where you wanted it, uh, beating your opponent because you hit such a wonderful clean shot that just popped off the racket. That is a high. And let's face it, a lot of people are addicted. And this is why I say enjoy the process rather than the match. You know, some people like playing matches and like getting wins. Some people just like hitting and they like that feeling of hitting with people. You know, so why are you going to cheat yourself when you could show up and have fresh strings, give yourself that opportunity to play your best, you know, like when you go out on a date, hey, you put on those fancy new clothes. But then you didn't take a bath for two days. Yeah, you look good. Yeah, you probably get away with it. But if things get down to the nitty gritty, you're going to be lacking. And it could ruin everything. So it's like my mom said, always have clean underwear. You never know when you're going to wind up in the hospital. And I guess her major fear in life was having her son go into the emergency room and have filthy underwear. The shame of the, forget about the broken legs and arms and, and they got me on the ventilator. It's the underwear that counts. Were the underwear clean? Because these random strangers will probably not take as good care of you if you got bad underwear, you're like, ah, this guy stinks. Let's let him fester there before. I'm going to go eat lunch in a little bit. I don't want to ruin my lunch. So they'll leave you there, soiled up, with your broken legs. And your mother warned you about that. So why are you going to show up to a match, especially a league match that counts for points for a team? <laughs> You're letting your team down. You're letting your coach down when you show up to a coaching section with old, crusty strings. Then they're yelling at you because you're struggling with shots and you could be struggling with targeting spots because your strings are crusty. And then you're trying to change form to adjust to crusty strings that's the worst thing you could do because then your form is all over the place you're questioning why you're even taking lessons if you don't improve you know if you don't improve on equipment on strings if you're hitting them with old tennis balls you know there's a certain point where a tennis ball you just shouldn't hit with it you know there's a certain point with strings you just shouldn't hit with it. There's even a certain point of of time where you need to change rackets. Like I said, carbon fiber rackets get micro cracks and it loses its its feel, its original feel. It may morph into a racket that feels even better for you. That could be the case. But one thing's for sure, it's going to change. And whether you like that change, whether you even notice the change, but the change is there. So you got to be aware of that. 
you know, you don't have to be. I mean, if you're watching this video and watching me ramble and you're looking for nuggets of information, then you're that type of player that wants to put your best foot forward. And this is one aspect to do it. So most people would have checked out by now on this video or fast forwarded. But if you're watching, then you're going to like my channel. You know, because I do maybe conspiracy deep dives into tennis. You know, people would dismiss it as hogwash. But let's put it on the table. Let's talk about it. Let's consider different things. Like I said, if you want to improve and you're a recreational player, you ain't got the time to put in 10 hours a week on court. You know, maybe you're practicing by yourself, which I commend you. You know, maybe you got a like-minded friend that practices with you, ideal. Now we're gonna cut our angle here. So we got all this extra left over. It's not too crazy, but I could probably do better. So now we came to the last cross. Here, we're gonna look for our finishing hole. So how do I determine what hole? Usually the pattern tells you but you could kind of tell by the size of the grommet. If it's a new racket, you could kind of follow the closest string that loops in. So this string over here, from here to here, the main is like this. It's looping in like this there. So what I want is to go into this hole because I'm coming from here and go closest one to tie off. So I want to go in from here to here along this bend to this string. So that's looped there in the hole in the racket. It goes out here and there. And I want to go in with the bent end where I have pressure is going to be on this side of the string. And I want it to be that side of the string. I don't want to come here where it loops from here to there and come in on the opposite side and have the pressure resting on the outside of the grommet. Doable? Yeah. Ideal? No. So if you can, which you should, go in with the bend and follow the bend. So this string is bent from here, from the main to here, and we're sharing the hole. We're going to come here. And we're going to go in with this string. A little confusing, but there's other videos that explain in much detail stringing. Probably better than I can. And again, the same knot I put up on top two times. I'm going to repeat down here. Knots never failed me. Oh, wait, I went on two strings there. So I'm not going to edit that out because we're keeping it as real as we can right there. See, so you can make a little mistake and you can go back and correct it. It's not the end of the world. Don't be afraid to buy a machine and practice and string your own. You'll have fresher strings. Release tension. Let the knot settle in with tension from the string. Take our angle cutter. Do you need an angle cutter? No. Ideal, do you want one? Yes. Because without an angle cutter, you're gonna have a sharp edge to the end of the, of the knot, the tailing, and you might scratch yourself, God forbid. So we want a nice blunt, flat, so you're gonna stab in yourself. Release this clamp, release that tension, but I'm bumped. So right now it looks pretty straight. Sometimes you may want to just 
adjust. I mean, that's pretty good. I was going nice and easy. Sometimes when I go a little faster, I need to make a little adjustment. The square is all straight. It looks good. So it's done. I'm going to loosen up this and it's not uncommon for these to be without tension because the tension uh, pressure changed on the face. And then we release the racket and we have, you could look at the racket from this angle and you could see if any missed holes. So I'm going to give you an example of that in a moment. I'm going to take my dampener, install it, because this is a thorough tutorial or video of how I strain. We're going to take my garbage twist tie. This way I never have to lose a, a dampener ever again and cause delay in a match. And that's good to go. Uh, now, this racket is old 200G childhood racket. I had strung it uh, recently. I went fast. And if you look at the angle, you know, it's hard to judge what you're looking at. You know. Now, if you look at this like this, you kind of see, you know, this string up here. You see, I pull it down, goes up. The box is uneven. That's because I skipped the string here. This one string went under the cross in a row. This one went under this one. So that's a missed cross right there. I didn't notice it till his end, so let's see if you could see it now. Now, I didn't notice it till the end. This is not a playing racket where I'm gonna play matches. This is just a fun little racket to have a hit. So I left it, you know, why waste the strings? It's outside the sweet spot. It's, I'm not looking for precision with this racket. It's not gonna break. So even though it's not perfect, I left it in and it'll last as long until it breaks or I decide to change it. So even with a mistake like that, if it's out of the sweet spot, you know what? It's not gonna kill you. I'd rather have fresh misaligned skipped cross string than old crusty ones that are strung correctly. Now, this is an example of a racket where I use the strings until failure. Now you could see how they're fraying. So in the main, this is natural gut. So it's in better condition than the cross. The cross is a different type string, I forget. Um, but this string frays a lot before it breaks. So right here, you can see I'm hitting in this area of the racket, which probably is a good sweet spot. And that's where most of the wear is. And finally, this string gave out. You know, uh, it's got natural gut in the cross, which is not notched. So I may just string the crosses again, save money. Natural cross gut is 50 a pack. So this one main cost me $25. And that's me installing it for free. So I could just change out the cross in this racket, but this racket is definitely changing my shots and accuracy, power level, everything where I have to change my technique to adjust from if they were new. So instead of messing with your technique and figure, trying to figure out why you're missing certain shots and you're like, oh, it's an off day, it's an off day. Maybe not. Maybe your string um, playability changed because of wear and tear. That's what I feel. That's why fresh strings are key to good tennis, putting your best foot forward. 
Now, this is a very long video. I appreciate you staying with me. If you've got any questions, I'll answer them in the comments. Um, if you got any hate, go ahead, paste it. You know, every suggestion is, is uh, welcomed and I'm open-minded and you may change my mind. You may give me a new idea and you may help my tennis and I hope I've helped someone's tennis and I've earned that subscription. So thanks for watching and let's go play some tennis.